Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Good morning. Welcome. Glad that you are here today, whether you're in Sinecourt East, Sinecourt West, whether you're worshiping at the Woodlands, whether you're worshiping online. Uh, However it is that you're here, we're glad that you're here. So we are going to continue a series that we've been doing the past several weeks. We're going to be in part four of a five-part series that we're doing from the book of Daniel, focusing on five key scenes in this book. So today, you're going to need your Bible, uh, so go ahead and open it up. Daniel chapter 5. If you need some Bibles, why don't you hold your hand up, and some ushers are coming in the aisles right now in all of our rooms, and they'll be glad to let you borrow one of those Bibles. And if you need a Bible because you don't have one, you just keep it. It's our gift to you. So Daniel chapter 5 in the Old Testament. While you're turning there, I'll just sort of bring us up to date, uh, remind us at least of where we've been. Um, You know, several weeks ago, we were talking about how the story began with King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who was the great superpower of that day, about 600 years before Christ. And one of the places that he uh, ransacked was Jerusalem, and he had kidnapped uh, many, several thousand young Jewish Uh, men, probably older teenagers, and had carted them off to Babylon in an effort to Babylonize them. He was working to get them uh, to forget about their homeland, to forget about the one true God, have them intermarry with beautiful Babylonian women and learn the the Babylonian customs and worship Babylonian idols. And and, um, that was the strategy. Well, one of these young men who got carted off was Daniel. And it's his life that we've been talking about. And it's a really relevant uh, book for us. We've been talking about this because... Daniel, who had been growing up in Jerusalem, uh, knew the one true God, but one day he wakes up in Babylon where they didn't recognize the one true God. And he had to learn, how do I live out my faith in the one true God without compromising that in the midst of all of this that I'm living in Babylon uh, around. How do I do that winsomely? It's very relevant for us because in this day and age, many people feel sort of like we're waking up in a land that knows not God anymore. Doesn't really have any desire to know much about God anymore. And sometimes Christians find themselves asking, well, how do I live now as a follower of, of the one true God, as we know him through Jesus Christ? How, how do I do that winsomely in this world in which we live now? It's very relevant. So chapter 5 uh, in Daniel. Uh, now, before, uh, actually, before we read, I need to, to uh, help us understand a couple of other things. And that is a lot have, of time has lapsed between chapters three and chapter five. Because uh, in chapter two and chapter three, you had uh, Daniel as a young man and Shadrach, Meshach, and Midnigo as as young men, probably, like I said, older teenagers. Now in chapter five, don't picture Daniel as an older teenager. Picture him now as an older man. He's in his young 80s. So a lot of time has been compressed uh, through chapter 4. Now, where's King Nebuchadnezzar? We have to understand that because the story is going to to, uh, revolve not around Nebuchadnezzar. Well, in this period of time that uh, has passed since we were last talking uh, from Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar would go on and he would reign, I think it was 43 years in Babylon. And then he would die and be succeeded by several kings with shorter stints. And then finally, another king would come along. His name was Belshazzar. And he's the one that we're going to look at uh, today. The scene is going to open with Belshazzar holding this magnificent um, uh, banquet this great party that he was having. Now, when you read between the lines, you're going to realize 
that this was really turning into a drunken orgy in the palace is what was going on, which would have been totally inappropriate back then, even as it would be inappropriate now um, for heads of state to lead out in. One more thing that you need to understand, and that is while all of this was going on inside the palace, there was something happening outside the palace and really outside the walls of Babylon. And that is the Medes and the Persians had joined forces together, determined to overthrow Babylon and to become the Medo-Persian Empire, the next superpower to succeed uh, Babylon. Okay, and they, by this point in this story where we come into, they have devoured most of the known world, but they couldn't crack Babylon. Why couldn't they get uh, into Babylon? Oh, they'd been trying. They'd been hammering away at it for several months. But, and Belshazzar could thank Nebuchadnezzar of old for this, Babylon was a mighty city. It was a, it was a veritable fortress. You had walls that surrounded the whole city of Babylon that were 87 feet thick. That's like from me to that camera back there. That is a thick wall, right? And the walls weren't just thick. They were tall, 350 feet tall, archaeologists tell us. That's, like a, that's more than a vertical football field. That is a tall wall. And periodically, you had watchtowers all around the perimeter that stood 25 stories I mean, this, in, the, in that day, this, that was, well, it was one of the wonders of the world that Babylon had, had been created by, by Nebuchadnezzar. It was quite a city, 15 miles square, and the Euphrates River uh, flowed right through the middle of the city. Bottom line now, um, Belshazzar, he wasn't worried about the Medes and the Persians outside those walls. He lived like hey, I'm the greatest ruler in the greatest city with the greatest walls, with the greatest armies. We're Babylon. What have we to fear? That's his posture as we come. I don't care about the Medes and the Persians out there. We're Babylon. Let's pick it up there. Verse one, many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles and his wives and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, wives and concubines drank from them. And while they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And suddenly... They saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. Go down to verse 10. But, the queen, but when the queen mother heard what was happening, she heard into the banquet hall. She said to Belshazzar, Long live the king. Don't be so pale and frightened. There is a man in your kingdom who has with him, within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding, wisdom like that of the gods. The last part of 12. Call for Daniel, and he'll tell you what the writing means. So they go and they find Daniel who had been uh, uh, in the innermost circle of Nebuchadnezzar, a trusted advisor, and you get the sense in chapter 4 that, that he and Nebuchadnezzar didn't become uh, friends, that, that Daniel really cared for Nebuchadnezzar. But his successors didn't have any interest uh, in that inner circle of Nebuchadnezzar and it put them out the pasture. And so <clears throat> Daniel's been living in obscurity now, not in the palace, for several decades. And uh, so... Uh, this is probably his first time back in the palace in quite some number of years. They bring him in. Um, verse 17, Daniel answered the king. Oh, I should have said, and Belshazzar, he was so frightened. He's offering, he's offering all sorts of, you'll become the third highest ruler in my kingdom and, and I'll put a purple robe on you, a gold necklace and on and on and on. Anybody who can tell me, what does that mean? So Daniel walks into that, 17. Daniel answered the king, keep your gifts or give them to someone else. But I will tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave sovereignty 
and majesty and glory and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him. He killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal. And he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow and was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the most high God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. Verse 22. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all of this. Yet you have not humbled yourself, for you've proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temple brought in before you. You and your nobles and your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising your gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear anything nor know anything at all. But you haven't honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Verse 24. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Many, many, takel, parsing. This is what the words mean. Many means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Takel means weighed. You've been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parsing means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and now is given to the Medes and the Persians. Verse 30, that very night Belshazzar the Babylonian king was killed. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. It's a fascinating chapter. It's a very cinematic sort of chapter. You can sort of picture this whole scene, right, that's happening. Three things I want us to, to observe. So if you're a note taker, and I hope that you are, and I hope in, even in your grow groups this week, you'll talk about these three things because they are so important for us to make sure that we're learning these three things from chapter five. The first one is this, pride goes before destruction. Pride goes before destruction. Proverbs 16, 18 says that. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Belshazzar, he was dripping with pride. He's arrogant. Everything in Belshazzar's world started with Belshazzar and ended with Belshazzar. And that's how it is with proud people, isn't it? That's always how it is. It's always about them. You see it in the media. You see it in Hollywood. You see it in the world of sports. You even see it in the world of politics. I was even thinking about this even this past week when I was watching the debate on TV. And I was noticing uh, several of the, the candidates, I don't know how to say it otherwise, but they, they just, they, they come across as very proud. Now, I might be wrong, and they might just be humble as the day is long, but I, I'm, I'm scared to draw near to proud people. And, and you know why? Because if you're proud, the Bible says God is not on your side. God's not on your side. Look at 1 Peter 5.5. 5. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So I try personally not to tether myself too closely to proud people because the handwriting's on the wall. It's only a matter of time. Sooner or later, proud people come crashing down. It's just a spiritual law that God has wired into the universe. If you want to build yourself up, God is going to have to bring you down. On the other hand, as James 4.10 says, if you work to humble yourself, God will lift you up. So don't act like you're the center of the solar system. God didn't create you to be the center of the solar system. And, and when we put ourselves in the center of the solar system, it's just a matter of time before the whole thing comes crashing in. And so even though Isaiah had predicted in Isaiah 13, 19, Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride will be overthrown by God, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though Isaiah had predicted that Belshazzar, he wasn't worried. 
He didn't care. He certainly didn't worry about God. Who needs God when you're Belshazzar? Now, we didn't work our way through chapter four. We passed over that one, but I hope that you'll go back and read it on your own because you'll discover something very important that happened towards the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life in chapter four. Um, God gave Nebuchadnezzar what you might call a divine front end alignment. God brought Nebuchadnezzar down to the level of a grass eating animal that nobody wanted. But what happened? Well, you picked it up because Daniel references this when he's recounting and getting ready to talk to, to Belshazzar about what it means on the wall. Through this pitiful experience, Nebuchadnezzar, he became humbled. And he was transformed. And by the end of chapter four, you'll see that Nebuchadnezzar actually came to honor and worship the one true God of Daniel. He realized, oh, did he ever realize that all he possessed was really a great gift from God. And so when Daniel comes into the palace to interpret the writing, he reminds Belshazzar, you knew, verse 22, you knew all of this. And still you've not humbled yourself. You knew what happened to your grandfather. But you didn't care. And <laughs> boy, did he not care. Almost as if to underscore. Almost as if to just bend over backwards to show how much he did not care about the one true God. What did it say in verse 3? It says he had, he had the sacred golden vessels which had been uh, taken from the Jewish temple about 70 years prior. And, and which were only ever to be used for worshiping the one true God. And he had those vessels brought in and, and, and so that they could do their partying with those vessels. I mean, it was like he was just blatantly in your face saying, I don't need you, God. <laughs> but before we get too critical of, of Belshazzar, I suppose we have to acknowledge um, that sometimes we do the, the very same sort of thing. You say, well, no, not me. I'd never do that. Well, I don't know. Have you ever heard somebody who, who says, I, I don't want to give my money away to God or to anybody. I don't care what God's word says. I made it. It's mine. I'm going to do with it what I want. I'm keeping it. Really? Or what about the uh, person who says, you know what? I don't care what God's word says about marriage and premarital cohabitation. Th that's the way we want to live. And we're going to do it our way. I don't care what the Bible says. Or maybe in the workplace, somebody who says, you know, maybe it's not 100% on the up and up, but I'm going to close that deal because I'm going to close that deal. I don't care. Really, it sounds a little bit like Belshazzar, or another who says, you know what, I've, I've struggled with these urges all my life, and I know what the Bible says, but I'm, I'm going to give in to these urges now. I'm tired of fighting it. It's the way I, is this the way I am? Really? Yet another who, who says, you know what, if you're going to be in my world, you're going to have to deal with my anger, because I just, I, sometimes I've got some anger issues. Yes, I may yell a little. Yes, I may rage a little. Yes, I may knock a few things over. Just deal with it. It's how I made. Really? Yeah, I don't care what the Bible says. Oh, really? Or the person who says, back off about that pornography thing. Hey. I'm a normal American guy. And so I got to check some things out sometimes. And, you know, God can just roll with that. Really? See, <laughs> I think none of us are exempt from this temptation to act like Belshazzar. Proud. Defiant before God, to say, I don't have to do life God's way. Sort of like the, the old Frank Sinatra, so I'll do it my way. That's the way I'm gonna do it. Bertrand Russell said, everyone would like to be God if it were possible, but it's not possible. 
And so no matter who you are, no matter how important you are, you're not God. And you have to realize that. I have to, all of us have to realize that. It's only by his grace that we're even here. Think about it. If he didn't give you the breath in your lungs this morning to have another day, you would not be sitting here. But he did give you that breath in your lungs. And he's given you everything else that you have. You say, no, no, I earned those things. It's all mine. I, I worked hard. Yeah, I know. But go upstream a little bit and see if you don't find your way back to God who gave you health and who gave you a good mind and who gave you strength. And ultimately, it all comes from him. And if you can't handle that, you're proud. Humble yourself so that God doesn't have to humble you. Well, it didn't take long, did it, in that party, uh, in the banquet room, for the mood to change. Everything changed in that moment, which brings us to the second observation I want us to make. We've got to learn this. False gods can never give us unshakable faith. False gods can never give us unshakable faith faith. So this hand from heaven writes some words on plaster and everybody gets sober real quick. And in an instant, they knew, whoa, these gods of gold and silver and bronze and wood and stone and all, these gods ain't going to cut it for that. Whatever that is, th that's bigger and that's, that, that's more powerful right there. You say, well, I think I'm safe on this one because I don't worship any false gods. Really? Let's think about that. I've seen any number of people who lose themselves in their work or their affluence or their net worth or their cars or their homes or their leisure activities or their sports or their physical fitness or their popularity or their influence. And what we fail to realize is that any of these things can become idols for us, replacements for God. Have you never heard someone who said, you know, I don't have time for God right now. I'm just, we're just so busy, you know? I, it's not that I've forgotten about God. I'm gonna get back to him, you know? But we just got so much going on in our lives right now. Do you not realize what you're saying is, I've just got some other gods I gotta serve right now, but I'll get back to that one later. But then one day the doctor walks in and says, it's cancer. Or in an instant, something or someone is snatched from us or our financial or professional world is just turned upside down and all of a sudden all those false gods of work or money or health or popularity or influence or whatever they're all worthless in a moment right because in that moment all of a sudden the person who didn't quite have enough time for God all of a sudden is saying God where are you help I need help please save do something all of a sudden things change in that moment, and we realize the futility of our false gods, don't we? And, and, and look, even those of us who, who love the Lord and who love church, and maybe you're here pretty regularly, and maybe you even have disciplined devotions, and you have a devotional life, and that's a wonderful thing. And I hope that all of you do, that you're developing a time where you're spending time with God every day, and we talked about that before. But even, 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 even if you're in this category, you have to realize you're not exempt. For, we're not exempt from this temptation. It takes a little bit of a different twist, but here's what happens. We say, oh, I I love you, Lord. I love the church. I love your word. You know, but if we're honest with ourselves, what many of us are really doing, and even as we're, we're not meaning to necessarily, but we're just, we're downsizing God, even as we're talking to him. We're downsizing the one true God down to just sort of the size of a little jar of seasoning salt that we can carry around in our purse or our briefcase and pull out whenever we need him and just sprinkle it on our lives so things will be a little bit better. We're not really laying ourselves bare before the Lord and saying, search me, O oh God, and, and help me to see if there's any way offensive in me. We're not really doing that. Rather, we're acting like old Shanghai Pierce the old Texas uh, rancher from 100 years ago who owned this great plantation and decided he was going to introduce some religion uh, I I into his ranch and built a church. And while driving around the acreage, um, a visitor said, asked Colonel P Pierce, do you belong to that church? To which he answered, belong to that church? 
The church belongs to me. And I think if we're not careful, we do that with God. Uh, what, what we say, I belong to God, but what we're really meaning is, no, no, God belongs to me. I kind of got this thing under control. Which means that even those of us who are professing to be, you know, growing Christians have somehow downsized the one true God of heaven into sort of a little rabbit's foot-sized God that we just carry along. But then the writing on the wall appears in our lives and all of a sudden we throw that out and say, okay, I need the one, I need the real God, like the real one. Forgive me, oh God, help, say we're scared, do something. You know. Now all of a sudden, we're interested in that God, right? Now, before we go on to the third thing, I, I, want, us to, you need to, I want us to think about this. Give them some thought to this this week. Why was Belshazzar so terrified? He couldn't read what the words meant, and nobody else could interpret what it meant. So why did he default in a negative direction? Why didn't he just default and say, I don't know what that means. You know, I don't know. It must mean something great about me, though, and something great about that. Why didn't he default that direction? Why does it say his knees started knocking and he turned white as a sheet and he was terrified? Why did he default that direction? I'll tell you why. Because he had a little thing inside of him that you and I have inside of us. Romans 2.15 talks about it. It's called our conscience. It's that little voice inside of our soul that, that you can't get away from. And so even though you're by yourself and you think I'm away from everything, you hear that little voice that says, you know that you should not be watching that right now. Or you hear that little voice say, you know you should not be going there. Or you hear that little voice saying, you should not be talking to him that way. You should not be talking to her that way. You know that you are flirting. You're like, Shut up. Where is that coming from? It's coming from your conscience that God has planted inside of you. Nobody has to tell you. Nobody had to tell Belshazzar. He knew. Uh-oh. I'm busted. I've gone too far. I'm done. He knew it before he even knew it. The best that false gods can offer us, friends, is false security. That's as far as they can bring you. So you can pretend like everything's great and everything's secure, but if it's a false god you're following, it's false security. And so if false security is what you want, then, then go ahead and go that way. But if you're searching for an unshakable faith of a rock solid faith that can withstand any shaking that comes along, then nothing short of the one true God of heaven will ever do for you. That one true God who made himself known to us through Jesus. Which leads to the final observation I want us to make today. The third one. You and I only have so much time. You and I only have so much time. Daniel started in finally. Mene, mene. Your days are numbered, Belshazzar. And so are mine. And so are yours. See, <laughs> the last of Belshazzar's problems was he never thought about what, how is this going to play out? How is this ever going to end? He just lived in the moment. He lived like he had forever, but he didn't have forever. And we don't. Nobody does. Hebrews 9.27 reminds us it's appointed, it's appointed unto man to die once and then to face the judgment. All of us, that's all of our stories. And we like the thought of judgment when it applies to other people, especially the bad people, like the really bad people who kill people and do violence. I can't wait till he stands before God someday. Yeah, but we kind of forget. Yeah, but so are we going to do that too? We, we kind of forget that part, right? And our lives, just, uh, just like Belshazzar's, our lives are going to be weighed in the balance as well. 
so will you be found wanting? I hope not. The Bible says there's only one way that you won't. Because you're a sinner. But don't let that hurt your feelings. I am too. All of us are. Romans 3.23 says clearly all of us have sinned. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But that's not where the story ends. Could have been where the story ends. Our God could have said, yes, you're all a bunch of rotten sinners. And he just could have hurled us off into the outermost galaxies. But he didn't do that. Instead of saying, I'll go and start another planet and try over with some new people and see if they can get it right. He said, no, I'm going to move towards you in your brokenness, in your sin, in your short fallenness. I'm going to become one of you. And he punctured the barrier between heaven and earth, took on flesh and blood as Jesus Christ came into this world, as Luke 2 says, and grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And for 33 years, he lived the sinless, perfect life that you and I could never live. No matter how hard we try to live that life, we can never live that life. And then after living that life of perfection, He said, now I'm going to do the unthinkable. I'm going to die for you. You deserve to die. You deserve to die and go to hell. I'm going to take that path for you. I'll stand in as your substitute. And he went to the cross and he died for us. But he didn't stay dead. On the third day, he rose again to life. And signifies, which signifies to all of us, you who are tethered to me, says Jesus, by faith, you too can have the assurance of your salvation, assurance of life, assurance of the resurrection in your own souls. And now he says, I am the only one who can save you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So put your trust in me. But we don't have forever to make that decision. Second Corinthians says today is the day of salvation. We have today. We don't know how long we have until our, each of our lives will end or until the Lord comes back, which Second Peter 3 says he is going to do. And when he does... He makes it very clear, the time for deciding will not, will be over. That will not be the time for deciding anymore. Time's over. Which way did you choose at that moment? It's what happened with Belshazzar, isn't it? And, And so if you continue to say no to God, one day he'll say no to you. But of course he would. It only makes sense, doesn't it? C.S. Lewis put it this way, the man who says to God, not my will, but thine be done, will one day hear God say, okay, not my will, but thine be done. Why would you think that you could act different, the same as Belshazzar and experience a different outcome? Well, verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed. It was October 539 B.C. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Incidentally, do you know how the Medes and the Persians got through those walls and into Babylon? This is interesting. This doesn't come from biblical history. This comes from secular history. But we know what the the Medo Persians did. They went upstream in the Euphrates and they built a dam and they siphoned off the water of the Euphrates into this big swamp land. And as the water levels descended in the river that flowed through the north part of the the, the walls of Babylon through the city and out the south, as the water levels uh, dropped, the troops marched in on near dry riverbed. Marched in, killed the guards, threw open the gates and took the city. And that very night, Belshazzar would die. Your days are numbered. So are mine. No matter how thick the wall is that you think you've built, no matter how fail safe you think and protected you are, you're not. Your days are numbered. So are mine. (laughs) 
I tell you, I, I've thought a lot about that this year, particularly after January 15th. I don't know, uh, some of you might have come in since then, and I don't have time to tell that whole story, but you can go back and listen to it online. Suffice it to say, on that day in January, I was just going through life the normal way. And little did I know, I was within hours of having a massive coronary. My LAD artery was 99% blocked. And the doctor said, that was going to be it for you within about 10 hours. But God in his graciousness, God in his goodness, orchestrated no less than about nine or 10 providential serendipities, each one of which, like dominoes being tipped over, led to my finally being in a hospital, having come through the whole procedure, lying there, recovering and realizing, oh my gosh, I'm on bonus time now. And ever since January 15th, I found myself telling myself at least once a day, sometimes it's when I get up and get out of bed, sometimes it's when I'm in the gym and I'm exercising, but at least once every day I find myself saying, you're on bonus time now. Make it count. Now the reality is I've always been on bonus time. All 49 of my years have been bonus time. And you're on bonus time too. The problem is many of us just, we don't realize that we're on bonus time, do we? And we go on our ways and we give into our Belshazzarian urges and we act like we're the center of the solar system. And God said, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. And sometimes in his goodness and his graciousness, he just pulls back the curtain enough to help us realize, no, you're not really in charge of this thing. So my exhortation to you with all the passion I can muster is surrender your life to him. Take him as your Lord. Trust in Jesus. Humble yourself. Repent of your sins. Don't cling to it in a proud way. Say, I've got to get into community. Get into, talk about these three things in your grow group this week. In fact, if you're not in a grow group, go to the meet and greet out in the atrium of, the, of, of East Center Court afterwards. And there's lots of people out there, they'd love to help you get into a, to a grow group. Get into a grow group so that you can begin to grow forward in your faith, learning how do I live as a follower of Jesus Christ. Choose him and have life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this riveting story of Belshazzar and for the utter relevance it finds in our own lives. God, forgive us. Each of us are a lot like Belshazzar, a lot more than we'd like to admit. Lord, my prayer is that each of us in our own hearts and souls and minds would even now soften, repent, turn from our ways and say, I need you, Jesus. If you've not ever said that before to Jesus Christ, you've never trusted him in the first place, I invite you right now, even as I'm praying aloud, you just say, Lord Jesus, I need you to be my savior. I need, I'm surrendering my life to you. You come into my, flood into my life with your Holy Spirit. And cleanse me and change me and redirect me and teach me what does it mean to live my life for your sake and for your glory. And for all of us who are here, who you've done that before, you've crossed that initial line of faith. But somewhere today, the Lord has spoken to you. My challenge and my invitation to you is you do, bus- you do business with him. Don't just put this out of your mind. But you come clean with him. Even in this quiet moment, just say, I need you, Lord. I need to come back to you. I need to have your lordship, your leadership in my life because you're the one true God. Forgive me for many times clinging to my other little superficial, dumb, silly gods of my own making and acting like you're just a little salt shaker kind of God that I can whip out whenever I need you. Help me to put you into the center of my solar system and faithfully learn how to keep you there, living for your glory in each one of these bonus days that we get. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. 
Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre, and I am sitting here with Pastor Ken, who just finished part four of the Unshakable series. Thanks so much for being here with us, Pastor Ken. Uh, we actually have uh, quite a handful of questions. People yeah. were very uh, interested in this series, and so I'm just going to launch into question number one. Uh, so the first question that came in was, how should Christians practice humility in front of others who maybe are not Christians or who maybe uh, carry with them a lot of pride? How do we practice those things in front of others who have a lot of pride? Yeah. Well, of course, I don't know the context of the questioner, um, but I guess it doesn't really matter. I mean, is it is it that person's spouse? Is it that person's boss? Is it that person's uh, child's teacher that they're alluding to that's this proud person? But I don't suppose it really matters. Um, I think probably when there's a proud person in our life, the temptation or the desire is we want to will humility onto them, which is probably what underlies that. But we can't will them into humility. So what do we do? Well, we cont- we we don't change. Right. We certainly don't try to become more like them. But we take the humble path and uh, trust that verse in James that we looked at that he will lift us up if we'll humble ourselves. And so uh, it seems rather simplistic. Uh, so how do we act humble when that person's acting proud? Well, you just keep doing it. Right. And trust that over time maybe the the steady drip on the rock will erode uh, and something in that person's heart will soften and there'll be a transformation. Absolutely. Ultimately, it's not really up to us. It's up to the Holy Spirit to kind of come in and make that change in that person's heart. Absolutely. And and so the next question uh, is actually a really, really good one. As far as um, they want to know, what is the difference between being prideful and then being proud of someone? So for instance, like if a mom is proud of her son for doing well in baseball, or like when Paul writes to the church and says, I am proud Uh, of what you are doing here. What is the difference between being prideful and then being proud? Sure. Yeah, because that's, that can be a fine line, can't it? So let's just drill into that a little bit. Suppose, um, well, first of all, even as the Apostle Paul illustrated, there must be some sort of healthy pride that we can take in celebrating another person's uh, victory, accomplishments. We see our son or daughter, you know, d- d- hit the home run or d- d- do the dance or, you know, whatever it is, or, um, or even the person that we're trying to disciple and bringing along in their faith and we see them get some traction or they prayed out loud in their small group and and we feel a sense of pride about that. Well, clearly that is a good thing. I think where the line must be is that we're crossing potentially is when now we're getting puffed up and drawing our energy from that person and from that person's accomplishment, or we go into a funk for the rest of the day if they strike out. Right. Okay, something's gone awry here. You were f- f- feeling good feelings for their sake, but now it's all about you. Right. Clearly, the, uh, the, the, the emphasis has changed, the focus has changed, and now what that person's doing is all about you. Somewhere in there, you cross that line and, and you're getting puffed up. Right. Um, or deflated, on the flip side of the coin, d- depending on that person. Right. And so I think that must be uh, the challenge for us to make sure that when we're talking about, I'm so proud of you, uh, or I'm proud to be your dad, or I'm proud to be, you know, that w- w- the focus that we're putting on is, is really on them. Right. It's not on me. And boy, pity the person who doesn't get to be with me because, you know, they'd really have a good dad then or they'd really have a good uh, teacher or, or something. Well, obviously, we just swung across that line. Right. And it's so easy to find our self-esteem or our worth in other things, whether it's you know, job or sure. uh, social groups or even your own children, which yeah. kind of brings, up, uh, brings us to the last question of 
um, it's so easy to create all these other idols in our lives mm -hmm. where we really just derive our self-worth out of just things um, yes. and instead of the one true God. And so how is it that we are able to identify the idols that are in our lives, especially if we're blind to them? Sure. Well, I think this is where community mm. comes in very importantly. Uh, you know, we don't take this journey with Christ by ourselves. Right. We have the indwelling of his Holy Spirit and we have the community of brothers and sisters who also are taking this journey mm -hmm. in Christ. And this is a place where community is very valuable. When particularly, I'm not even thinking now about a grow group that has 10 or 12 or 15 people co-ed, mm -hmm. uh, but a subset of that. Maybe you have one person in particular, uh, same gender that you have a lunch with periodically or, or even weekly. and in more of a very transparent, um, you know, forthright conversation where you can say, hey, you help me, you, like God, you search my heart and help me know, is there any wickedness inside of me that you see? Is there anything I'm putting ahead of the one true God uh, that I might be blind to? Right. And a good loving brother or sister in the Lord will say, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have been noticing, you know, you seem to be spending so much time or so much energy and so much of your self-worth and everything is tied up in this. And a spouse can do this too, right? Um, sometimes even when you don't ask, a, a spouse can help us <laughs> to identify those idols. The question is then will we be humble right. to receive that word and make adjustments and corrections accordingly? Absolutely, yeah, it's vital that we have those people that we can trust completely, be vulnerable and honest with, and who we know we can trust their feedback, yeah. um, and we can apply that to our sure. lives. Yeah, I'll say one other thing, and, and that is the, the value of listening prayer. Mm -hmm. I think so often in many people's devotional lives, in my devotional life, it's easy to um, even be busy in our devotions. Busy, I've got to read this passage. Busy, I've got to jot down some thoughts from this passage. Busy, I need to, to pray because I need to get on. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm just going to sit before the Lord and just give him 15 minutes right. and just sit silently and just say, search my heart, O oh God. And because you do that and you'll be surprised at how quickly he will put something on your mind. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about this, now that you've given me a little time to actually sit still and listen. Um, so he, he can reveal those things to us, but so it's, it's a both and, I think. Right. Sometimes we just have to block out the noise from the rest of the world, and, and that's when we can really hear God speaking to us about those things. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Ken, for being here with us today, and thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.